Good morning. We are going to get started. If you could uh, rise with me, please rise and uh, let us take some time to quiet our hearts before worship. Yeah. 
chapter 2, that Christ became obedient to death and even death on the cross. And that is why he's given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord.
Praise be to God. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord. How many of you guys are excited to be here? Amen. 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 It's always good to be in the house of the Lord to worship. And those of you that are joining us uh, with us online, we welcome you as well. Uh, we hope that you will be blessed uh, as we continue to have our time of worship. Today, uh, I want to uh, let you know that we have a special treat for us today. We have a guest speaker that is not a stranger to many of us. But for some of you, he might be new to you. Um, we're going to have the Reverend Ray Vijegas, Vijegas, that's how you pronounce it, Vijegas, come and minister to us in the word. Now, this, he's not to be confused with the Reverend Ray Rosa, who's also within our midst right here. Uh, we have two ordained pastors named Ray in the house. Amen. Amen. Now, the, the, the beauty about this is both uh, Pastor Ray's have been transformed by the power of the gospel. Now, if I were to go and tell you all the things that Reverend Ray V. Jagus did uh, in terms of his non-glory days, <laughs> I could be here all day long. But to know that God has done a miracle work in his life, it's just amazing. So for those of you who don't know, formally, let me introduce you to him. He is the regional director at Young Life. A QBS, which stands for Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, okay? I don't know if I pronounced it right, but Staten Island, okay? So QBS, and he has been doing this for the last three years, four years? Five years, okay. This uh, uh, power couple, Ray and Sarah, had been in the ministry since they were in their early 20s, okay? So they've been doing ministry for some time. They started with uh, Youth for Christ up in the... Uh, um, Schenectady, I can't even pronounce the word, Schenectady area upstate New York, and then God has uh, um, shifted their ministry uh, to now serve with Young Life. And so, without further ado, may I present to you our guest speaker, Reverend Ray Jagis. Amen. Testing. Very good. Sounding clear. I have some props today that I'm going to use later on. So it's good to be with you all. I want to give a shout out to my father, one of my fathers in the faith, Al Warren. Love you, brother. Continue persevering and being strong in the Lord. Shout out to Jaden the Wise, Ruel the Brave. Those are my two sons. They couldn't be here today, but um, they're watching at home. And it's good to be with you online. It's good to be with you all here. If you didn't know it, today is Marathon Sunday. The New York City Marathon is going on 
in New York City. I had the privilege of running the New York City Marathon and completing the New York City Marathon in 2014. I, ever since I was young, I enjoyed running. And um, I particularly enjoy races because races are exciting. Now, there's good things about races, and then there are hard things about races. Races are exciting, and the New York City Marathon is one of the most exciting races to be a part of. I can remember being on Staten Island in the wee hours of the morning, freezing as we waited three hours for the race start to begin. But everyone is excited. People are huddled up and have all these clothes on, and there's just an energy, an energy in the atmosphere, especially when they call us to line up. And especially when the race starts, everyone is excited. I love the fact that in the marathon, there is a beginning and there is an ending. It's like you know clearly where to start and where you're headed and when it's going to be over. And that is fun. But there are also difficult parts of running a race. You know, for those of us who who have run a, a, a race, you know that in the beginning of the race, you're fresh. You're excited. There's that nervous energy of, you're going to do this, and did I train enough? Did I, am I ready? Am, how am I going to do? What's my time going to be? And there's an excitement, and you start running the race, and you just, you're running hard. And I remember running my first marathon, and those first two miles, I was flying, flying. Not keeping track of my pace, but flying. But then there's a part of the race where things start breaking down. Muscles start breaking down. You start getting cramps in your quads or in your hamstrings or in your, in your calves. And it's hot, right? And, and, and then you begin during the race to question, is this race worth running? I mean, you get to the halfway mark of the marathon, 13.1 miles, and you're like, all right, I made it halfway. But then you realize, I have another 13.1 miles to go. And then you get to the 16th mile, and you begin to wonder, you know, I've ran 16 miles. Is that good enough? I mean, that, that's, that's a lot. And so in the race, you're tested. And I love the word of God because... God is so good. He wants us to be equipped. And in the word of God in Hebrews, it talks about life being like a race. That he has called each one of us to run. And there are good things about running the race. The start of it, the end of it. We know for sure the end is going to be glorious. But there's that in between. It's like on the tombstone... You see the birth date and you see the, the end date, but there's that dash that represents so much of running the race. And I believe that I'm confident that today God has you here, whether online or in person, because he wants to encourage us. He wants to encourage us to run the race of faith with courage, with commitment, with perseverance. And I believe that there are people here, some of us are on the sidelines. We're just watching. We're those spectators who haven't started running our race yet. And I believe God wants those of us to start running the race today. And there are some of us who have been running the race, and it's become really hard. And it's become really discouraging. And he wants to encourage us. And then there are some of us who at the end of our race, and God wants to encourage us to finish strong. So let me pray for us, and then let me dive into the word. Father, thank you that you have us here today, and thank you that you are a God who is living and active, that you are a God who listens to our prayers, you hear our cries, and you invite us to boldly approach your throne because there we will find mercy and we will find grace to help us as we run the race. Lord, speak to us today. Encourage us. I pray no one leaves here the same. But that, Lord, 
you would speak to us in a way that we would know, that we would know, that we would know we heard from you. Give us ears today. Encourage us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And the Lord brought me to this, this letter in the Bible because it is one where God's people are discouraged. God's people are experiencing disappointment. They are experiencing fear. They are experiencing a lot of challenging uh, life circumstances, and they are at risk. They are at risk of falling away from the faith. They are at risk. They're at that 16-mile point in the race, and they're at risk of just giving up and walking off the race and ending. And the writer is writing to them to help them refocus, to help them reframe their perspective and to focus on the right things. Why? So that they can find the help that they need so that they ultimately can finish running the race. And in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, I'm going to read these three verses. We have a beautiful exhortation from the writer where he takes life and he frames it in the imagery of running a race. Follow along with me. In the NIV it reads, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The word of the Lord. Well, as we look into this word in Hebrews, these first three verses, I want to share a few stories with you this afternoon, and hopefully I want to give us some, some application that we can walk away from this experience and put into practice in this next week before us. So as I said, um, I'm a runner, and um, I've been running um, for many years. Back when I was a young person, I was never in organized sports, but I got myself in a lot of trouble where I had to run away from a lot of people. So that's where my career began. Then um, as a Christian, I had the opportunity to go to Nyack College, shout out to Nyack, and it was my first time um, joining organized sports, and I joined the cross country team. And I learned some things about running that carried carried me into my, my marathon experiences. First of all, I'll say this. On Marathon Sunday in the morning, when you get to Staten Island, you'll see crowds of people huddled up. People will actually be wearing thick, heavy parkas like this. They'll have thick coats on. They'll have, you know, um, jogging pants. They'll have scarves. They'll have hats. Why? Because at the beginning of the race, it's cold. And you know you don't want your muscles and stuff to cramp up. So people show up with extra stuff on their bodies. Now, what I learned is that when it comes to running a race, there may be some things that are helpful at the very beginning, maybe pre-race. But when it comes race time, there are some things you just need to take off because there is no way you're going to run 26 point miles with a thick, heavy coat on or whatever stuff. And today I believe there are some things both that God wants us to consider taking off so that we could run the race. And there are some things he wants us to be very intentional about putting on. And my desire is that you will leave here encouraged and equipped. As we look into Hebrews chapter 12, these first 
three verses. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. One of the reasons why I love the faith, that I love the word of God, that I love Jesus is because he is calling us to run a race that is a heavenly calling. There is nobility in this race. There is honor in this race. And we have brothers and sisters both here in scripture and in, in our lifetimes who are these great cloud of witnesses who have run their race, have experienced the difficulties of running the race, and have been victors. And we have some of them here. Pastor Al is one of them for me and Lori. Men and women who have had courage to follow God into hard places like Newark, New Jersey, <laughs> or New York City, or into job situations, or into relationships, or into periods of illness, periods of setbacks financially, business deals that have gone wrong, etc. But who, because of their faith in Jesus, have been able to keep running, keep putting their feet in front of one another. And we have those people surrounding us that we can tap into their strength and be encouraged and in this scripture, God is showing us there's a, a whole hall of fame in the previous chapter, Hebrews 11, where we read about these great heroes of the faith, women and men like Esther and David and um, Daniel and um, so many incredible people who, you know, who were running their race and experienced great challenges and yet still overcame those challenges. And that's what God is calling us to. And I love that about God because I don't know about you. I, you know, I want my life to count. I don't want to live just a comfortable, easy life. I want to make an impact on this world. I want to slay Goliaths like David did. I want to stand in fiery furnaces like the three Hebrews. I want to be like Esther and take a stand and risk my life to save a whole people. God is calling us to... You know, the, the more abundant life isn't the more comfortable life. It isn't the more easy life. It's a rich life. Of course, it's, it's full of joy. It's full of love. There's, there's affection. There's beautiful relationships. There's nice homes in it. There's beautiful vacation experiences, travel. There's all of those. Those things are not wrong. But those are not the full things of life. The full things of life is going into a marriage, committing yourself to someone, and experiencing the, the challenges of learning how to love one another, experiencing heartache, anger, arguments, and by faith, because of your faith in Jesus, you work through those things. The rich life is experiencing setbacks and not giving up, but, but moving forward, persevering, trusting, praying, being in a group, confessing, encouraging one another. The rich life is experiencing the ups and the downs, the starts of the race, the 16 miles, the cramps, the tired weariness, but you keep moving forward. And God is calling us to that, to that fuller life. In, this, in these three verses, we find encouragement for the race. We find encouragement. And so I want to focus on a few things right now. He says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we have these examples. Let us throw off everything that hinders. What are some of the things that hinder us that we need to get rid of? What are the, those big heavy coats that we need to get rid of? I want to propose one of them is disappointment. How many of you here today, maybe you online, have experienced great disappointment? It is so awful. It is so awful when you have this newfound faith in God and you're excited. You want to live out your faith. You want to be like David. You want to be like Paul, be like Esther, be like Deborah. And you start taking step of, steps of faith, but things don't turn out the way you were hoping for them to turn out. I remember... I was 16 years old. I was on my way to youth group. And I was, 
Look, Lori, Al, there are people here in this church who saw me grow up in the faith, me and Sarah. And I remember we were, I was just starting to go to uh, basic at the QCAC back in college point, the, the small little church building. I'm taking us back. And I remember I, I was in the Bronx, so I had to take a train, a few trains, get to Main Street, and then catch the bus from Main Street. And so I get to the train station in the Bronx, and there's this young girl asking for a token. This is back, I know, I'm dating myself. This is when we used tokens, not Metro cards, not this new thing. We had tokens. And I remember I had, I had a token. I had two tokens and then like a dollar. And this girl was asking for a, a token to get on the train. So I was at this place in my life where, yo, I was like, I'm trying to live every opportunity to express my faith. I want to take it because I want to I wanna be that person who experiences what God wants for them. And so I gave her, I gave her a token, which means that I used my other token. This was before transfers. And so I got on the train, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get to Main Street. I have a dollar. At the time, it was $1.25. All I need is 25 cents. Come on, God. Like, 25 cents to God, what is that? Nothing. He's easily, I'm going to walk. I'm going to find a quarter on the floor. I'm going to bump into someone at the bus stop that's going to basic, and I'm going to ask them for, I know somehow God is going to come through. So I get to Main Street, and I'm, I mean, I'm looking. I'm expecting, Right? And I don't find any quarter. One bus comes, another bus comes, and I'm like, all right, Lord, like, come on, like, what's going on here? And, okay, I was like, all right, maybe, God, you want me to humble myself. So I'm going to start asking people for a quarter. And that was scary, but, again, I was in this mindset of, I want to be as uncomfortable as I have to to live out my faith. And if it means asking for a quarter, I'm going to do it. I start asking people on this line for a quarter. And they're looking at me like, like I'm a drug addict. Like they don't trust me and won't want to give me a quarter. And I remember I got to a point that day where I was just very disappointed. I ended up going, I, I ended up saying, you know what, I'm just going to go home. I was living in Jackson Heights, Queens at the time. I went down to the train station in Main Street, and there were about four police officers by the turnstile. And look, I was, at that point in my life, at that point, I was a good kid. I was like, yo, I'm going to youth group, come on. Like, they're going to give me a break here. And I asked them, excuse me, officers, um, I, I gave my token away to someone who needed it. I need to get on the train. Can, can you let me go through for a dollar? Nope. Nope. Yo, I was so disappointed. I remember walking. I was like, all right, Lord, I'm just going to walk home. I remember walking from Main Street to Willard's Point. I was weeping. I mean, tears were like, God, Why? A quarter? And I remember just being so frustrated and disappointed. And asking God, I don't understand this, but I, I, I remember I'm just going to praise you. But I carry that disappointment with me to this very day, like, Lord. And there have been many other things. We just got great news that we got an apartment in Long Island City. We have been praying for a new apartment, a new home. I mean, the pandemic was horrendous and being four of us in a small space was a real test and I remember praying all right Lord here's the square footage I want I want this kind of you know bedroom I want this many bathrooms this this and that and we got an apartment but it's not exactly the apartment that I wanted I'm still grateful but there's something about disappointment that God allows us to go through because he wants to grow our faith. Faith is not, Lord, we ask for this specifically. You give us this exactly the way we ask for it. Part of the Christian faith is learning to navigate disappointment. 
It means taking off disappointment and exchanging it for something better. And I believe God wants us to make that exchange today. Some of you may be disappointed. Disappointed with a person that you are in a relationship with. Disappointed with test results, uh, a school you are applying for. God is saying to you, don't let that take you out of the race. Just because things don't happen. Can you imagine Joseph being betrayed by his brothers? Didn't do anything wrong. Thrown in a pit. Then he goes to Potiphar's. There he's set up. Then he's thrown in jail. Then in jail, he gives these two guys an interpretation of a dream. Tells them, don't forget me. Like, just remember me when you go before the king. I shouldn't be in here. Help me out. They forget him for like two or three years. Can you imagine the disappointment that Joseph experienced? See, but God was still at work. And sometimes the things that we desire, the specific things we're hoping for, when they don't turn out the way that we hope that they would, we can get discouraged. We can say, oh, God must not be real. God does not answer prayer. God didn't save this loved one. But God is at work, and he's doing something amazing. And instead of clothing ourselves with disappointment, God wants us to clothe ourselves with perseverance. Perseverance. It's not a word that, you know, we hear encouraged a lot. But perseverance is very important to this Christian faith. It's very important to running the race in such a way that we can win the prize. What is perseverance? Perseverance is the ability to do or achieve something despite difficulties, despite failure, despite opposition. And God is calling us today to clothe ourselves, take off the disappointments that we carry with us, get rid of them, and let's put on perseverance. The scripture goes on to talk about sin. And there's all kinds of sin. We could talk about a whole litany. There are some easy ones that everyone thinks of right away. And then there are some more subtle sins that we don't think about. But as we're running the race, we need to take off those sins that entangle us. One of those sins is thinking that we know what's better for us than God knows what's best for us. It's the sin of a pride that we think, man, if I was in control of my life, I could do it so much better than you, God. If you will just get your act together and get in alignment with my plan and agenda. And that is not the way we're going to finish running the race. There is a humility that we need to clothe ourselves with. There is a, a posture of, Lord, I don't understand this. But I know that you are good and your ways are much higher than my ways and I will trust you. Lord, I don't know why we didn't get the three bedroom apartment. But I know you have a plan and your plan is much better. You know what I think about? I'm going to take us back for a minute. You remember Karate Kid, like the original Karate Kid, Daniel LaRusso and Mr. Miyagi? Do you remember when Mr. Miyagi had Daniel Working in his, it's like, yo, this guy is using this kid. He had him, what was it? He was painting the fence. He was sanding the floors. And Daniel was like, yo, what is going on here? Like, you have me working like crazy. And he thought it was just, there was no purpose in it. But you see, God is masterfully purposeful. And the difficulties, the disappointments that we encounter are a setup. They are a setup to prepare us for what is to come. Therefore, it behooves us to take off the disappointment, to put on perseverance, and to put on humility, understanding, yo, God knows what he is doing. It goes on to say, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know that God has so much good in store for each one of us? Do you know that the pathway, the race, you see it says here that we have a race marked out for us. In Ephesians, it says that we are God's masterpieces. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which what? God prepared in advance for us to do. There is a race that God has prepared in advance for us to run. There are specific things that he has prepared in advance for us to experience and some of those are incredibly beautiful things and also incredibly difficult, challenging, testing experiences. But all of those things are God's recipe to create in us a maturity that is tried by the ups and downs of life. Some of us here have not started running the race yet. Maybe we've heard about our parents running the race. We've seen other people run the race. We've observed. And today I believe the Lord is saying, it is time for you to start running the race that I have created for you to run. There is a reward at the end of this race. We know in Scripture for Jesus, he received the name that is above every name. We know that for Jesus, he is in glory, chilling with legions of angels, with saints from the past, worshiping. We know that, that, that God has glorified him. But do you know that there is a reward? There is something beautiful, something so special that God has created for us to obtain in the race that we run? You know, when I ran the marathon, this was my reward. This was my medallion. I have this in my office and it's a reminder of what I've accomplished. But what God has prepared for us, I'll tell you right now, it's better than some medallion. He has something that, it, it, it says in scripture that we can't even comprehend how incredible are the things that God has prepared for us. And so as we run this race, Consider the things you need to get rid of. I would encourage us, disappointment is one of those things that can take us out. If we don't reframe our thinking to understand that life is full of good things and really difficult things, and we expect that Christianity is all about living the good life and having everything we want and being as comfortable as possible, we are at risk of not completing the race that Christ has marked out for us. So today the Lord is helping us recalibrate. We also must take on the clothing of perseverance to push forward one step after the other. We must put on humility to understand God knows what he's doing. He's preparing us. You know, one of the things that I love about Jesus, that I love about the gospel, that I love about the God that we believe in, is that he is the author and perfecter. He is the pioneer. Why do I love Jesus? He did not live a comfortable life. Think about this for a minute. He came into life and was born in a manger. Like, come on. I've said this here before. Why not like the Hilton? This is God. Like, come on. There wasn't one room where he would have just had the suite. You know, Mary and Joseph would have been chilling. Someone would have brought him water. It would have been nice and comfortable. No, he was born in a manger. And throughout his life, he experienced these adversities that we experienced. His cousin was killed unjustly. That was a tragedy when John the Baptist was beheaded. You know how that grieved Jesus? He understands what it means to lose a family member that he loved. And I know there are some of us who have lost someone, and it just, it just does not make sense. God could have. He could have opened the door. He could have made a way for John, but it was part of God's plan somehow, some way. It was a part of God's good plan. Jesus had close friends that didn't understand him. I mean, his disciples, 
walked, some of them walked away. Jesus experienced trauma, abuse. He was abused. He was beaten. He was mocked. The, the Son of God experienced condemnation. He was condemned to death. And they shouted, crucify him. He experienced loneliness in the garden where his, his closest crew, his squad, they could not just stay up and pray with him. In his deepest, darkest moments, he experienced what it means to be alone. And he said, Father, even, even his, his connection to God, it felt disconnected. Why have you forsaken me? He ultimately experienced death. But we know in the good news that Jesus completed his race. As an example to us, this is a part of running the race, but it's going to be okay. It doesn't last forever. There is a finish line. And so, dear brothers and sisters, God's given you a baton. It's a golden baton. Some of you have yet to take it. I want to encourage you. Take the baton that was marked out for you. It is the, the best path of your life. It is the most purposeful thing you can do with your life is to say, Lord, I want to run the race that you've marked out. Give me my golden baton and help me to finish the race you have given me. Some of us are at that place in the race where we're like ready to put it down on the floor and say, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. God is saying, no, take up your baton. You can do this. Take on perseverance. Trust me. And then some of us are at the end of our race. We know that the end is near. The finish line is close. God is asking us, those of us who are there, steward these last few miles very well. Be careful. Be deliberate. Be intentional. Be strategic. Finish your race strong. Be courageous. It takes courage. I have this rock. I'll end with this. I have this rock. I'll end with this and a poem. <clears throat> I have this rock. It says, through faith. And on it, it says, it's um, from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 33 to 34. It says, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Hebrews 11, 33 to 34. I have this stone and as a reminder that there will be giants who come in front of me to stop me from running my race. But through faith, I can slay the giants. Let me close with this. God wants you to slay the giant that come to intimidate you from running your race. And disappointment is a part of it. I want to leave you with this, this poem that in one of the darkest moments of my faith journey, someone passed this on to me, and it has been a source of strength. It's called Disappointment, His Appointment. Change one letter, then I see that the thwarting of my purpose is God's better choice for me. His appointment must be blessing, though it may come in disguise. For the end from the beginning, open to his wisdom lies. Disappointment, his appointment. Whose? The Lord, who loves me best. Understands and knows me fully, who my faith and love would test. For like loving earthly parents, he rejoices when he knows that his child accepts unquestioned all that from his wisdom flows. Disappointment, his appointment. No good thing will he withhold. From denials oft we gather treasures of his love untold. Well, he knows each broken purpose leads to fuller, deeper trust. And the end of all his dealings proves our God is wise and just. Disappointment, his appointment. Lord, take it then as such, like the clay in hands of potter, yielding wholly to thy touch. All my life's plan in thy molding. Not one single choice be mine. Let me answer unrepining. Father, not my will, but thine.
Let's pray. What a privilege, Lord, to bask in your presence today, to gather together, to spur one another on to love and toward good deeds, to, to spur one another on to start running the race, to keep running the race, to run the race and finish well. Lord, as you, as you light our path, guide our next steps, and help us to run the race you've marked out for each one of us with courage for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please rise? The race of life is difficult at every stage, but we don't run this race alone. As long as we fix our eyes on Jesus, let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Say that one more time. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Oh, you are